Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I am um, happy that you're all here this morning. I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, we are pleased to have Michael Palmer here to discuss his book about Eric Mendelssohn and his synagogue architecture. One of the shuls is right here in Michigan in Grand Rapids. I really hope you'll enjoy the presentation and I will remind you at the end as well, but um, I wanted to let you know that we're having another presentation um, on Sunday, June 27th. It's a virtual tour of the Museum of Tel Aviv our Museum of Jewish People in Tel Aviv. It'll begin at 10.30 a.m. that day. It's about a 45 minute tour. Um, a real live tour guide will show us around the museum. Um, I'm gonna post it today on Facebook and the registration um, link will be available on the Shul website later today as well. Um, that's $10 per household to attend and we really hope you can make it. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to um, pass the baton to Michael Palmer and let him begin. Okay, thanks a lot, Beth. And sure. Thank you everybody for coming and thanks to Beth Shalom for having me here this, this morning to talk to you. So this is the book and um, it's available on Amazon if you're interested. So if you go to the Amazon, go to Amazon and search on Eric Mendelssohn and my name, Michael Craig Palmer, then you will get taken to the page Amazon has for the book. Uh, as far as questions and answers today, I'm gonna do it twice. I'm gonna stop about midway through in about half an hour and open it up for questions about the first part of the talk. And then again, at the very end, we'll stop once more and have an opportunity for questions, answers, and comments or whatever at the very end also. So before we get into the, the really meat of the, of the presentation, let me just say a word about how I got into Eric Mendelssohn and taking pictures of his synagogues. Actually, this, this wasn't something I was interested in until a few years ago. I had a career in the pharmaceutical industry for a long time and uh, came to this uh, when that was winding down. Uh, one of the things I did when I was working in pharmaceuticals was to work for a, a company in Tel Aviv. And um, I was there for a couple of years. And during, during my lunch breaks, when I was in Tel Aviv, I liked to go for walks around the city. And I walked into a neighborhood sort of in the center of Tel Aviv near the, near the Mediterranean, where there were a lot of very interesting, um, very modern looking, buildings, some of them in kind of decrepit shape, some of them in better shape. There are lovely trees in Boulevard. It was just a great place to sort of change the view from, from the workaday world. And I discovered uh, soon after that th that was actually called the White City of Tel Aviv. It was a neighborhood of Tel Aviv that was built mainly in the 1930s, uh, built and occupied by refugees from Germany and other areas of Europe who came to British Mandate Palestine during those years. And the buildings that they had built had a very modernist European look and, and, and vibe. It was like a, almost like a European Mediterranean city and not a Middle Eastern Mediterranean city. Um, when I was back in Tel Aviv around 2014, I went back to the White City and it was very much the way I remembered it to be in the 90s, um, except everything was a lot more expensive Lots of the buildings had been restored and renovated. Uh, it was still a lovely neighborhood and a lovely place to just be and hang out. And I wanted to learn more. So I discovered that there are tours of this neighborhood in Tel Aviv. And one of the places that gives a tour is called the Bauhaus Center. So I went there, I signed up for a tour. I took a tour with the director of the Bauhaus Center. His name is Michal Gross and he explained what was going on. And at um, we finished that tour and by happenstance, I met him the next day on the street and I happened to have my camera gear with me. And he said, well, you know, I published books about Tel Aviv and about the White City and I'm working on a book now. We're looking for a photographer and uh, you, maybe you'd like to do that. So I, I was enthusiastic. I took some photos, to see how it would go. I showed them to Mika and, and he, he liked them. So that, that took care of 2015 for me. I was occupied really for the entire year, going around the white city in Tel Aviv, looking for specific aspects in specific buildings. And that went into a book that was published in the beginning of 2016. Now, when that project wound down, I, I really wanted to keep that up. So I went to Mika Gross and spoke to him and he didn't have anything in particular, but he mentioned this architect, Eric Mendelssohn. And um, Mendelssohn was born in 1887, he died in 1953. So, uh, by 2015, when I spoke with Mika Gross about this, he was, he was long gone, but his buildings were still in Israel. They were still 
in Europe and they were still in the US. So Mika told me about him and mentioned that there, there seemed to be a need for updating um, the discourse on Eric Mendelssohn. So I, I was put in touch with an academic named Ita Heinz Greenberg, who worked for 10 years, taught it for 10 years at the Technion. When I met Ita, she was um, on the faculty at the Swiss Technical University in Zurich. She is one of the world's experts on Eric Mendelssohn. She was enthusiastic. So that was the beginning of this project. I went to the Park Synagogue in Cleveland and that's what we're looking at on the screen. That's the Park Synagogue dome. I walked into the building, walked under that fantastic dome. I knew right away, this building alone was worth a book. And um, to make the story complete though, I realized I had to speak to all four of the synagogues, so I did. So through 2016 into 2017 and 2018, I spent time going around to each of these synagogues and taking photographs. And the result of that is the book that we're gonna talk about this morning, Eric Mendelssohn's Synagogues in America. So let's start with the conversation. So basically we'll have four units to, to the conversation today. We'll talk a bit about Mendelssohn's dwelling and wandering. As I mentioned, um, he was born in Germany. He was a German Jew. He wandered a lot and reestablished himself several times in Europe, in Israel, and in the United States. We need to look at that in a little bit of detail. We'll look at Mendelssohn's circle, particularly the people he knew in Berlin and, and some of the people that he knew when he lived in, in British Palestine. We'll look at some of the work he did when he was reestablishing himself multiple times in this wandering phase. And finally, we'll look at Mendelssohn's work, uh, these synagogues in the United States. So this is um, a quick view of Eric Mendelssohn's wandering. He really did travel around the world. So as I mentioned, he was born in Germany. He was a German Jew. He had a practice in Berlin, Germany. When Hitler came to power in 1933, Mendelssohn um, was forced out, expelled actually, from the, the Prussian Architectural Society, and he couldn't practice his, his profession anymore. He and his family left Berlin. He moved to England, where his wife had some family. He spent um, some six or seven years in England, and at the end of the 30s, he moved to Jerusalem, and he he um, opened up an office. He actually he'd opened office initially in Jerusalem in 1935, and for a number of years. He had an office in Jerusalem and an office in England. In 35, he moved full time to Israel, he made Aliyah, he was there until 1941. And then he began this very long journey um, in 1941 from British Palestine to the United States. And the reason he, had, he decided to leave Palestine in 1941 was because he couldn't work anymore as an architect. So the war in the Mediterranean, of course, was heating up. The British war effort was requisitioning all the supplies that could have gone to construction. There was no way to build anything in Palestine. It was all going to the war effort. He was frustrated, he left. And he took this very roundabout journey from Jerusalem to Basra, Basra to Karachi, Karachi to Bombay. Um, this leg across the Indian Ocean from Bombay to Cape Town, South Africa, then a dangerous trip in the middle of the Second World War from Cape Town to Port of Spain, Trinidad. From Port of Spain, he went to New York in the Hudson Valley, and that's where he spent the, the war years. In 1945, he moved to San Francisco. And the story we're gonna be most concerned about today is a story that begins around 1945 or so. All the buildings we're gonna be looking at were built in the late 1940s when Mendelssohn was had opened his office in San Francisco and was practicing as an architect there. So his time in Germany. Um, little Eric Mendelssohn is the young boy on the left of this photograph. He's standing next to his older sister. His older brother has his arm on his shoulder. And this picture was taken when Eric was about seven years old. So this is about 1894. And the town they lived in is Allenstein in East Prussia. Uh, it was Germany, then it's Poland right now, but certainly when the Mendelssohn's was, was there, it was, it was the very heart of, of Germany. Um, I think when I look at this photograph, a couple of things are apparent to me. One is that um, it looks like they were a prosperous family, the Mendelssohn family. The children are well taken care of, they're fed, they're they, they look healthy, their clothes are well, they could afford to even have this photograph taken. Um, and that's important to know. And as a matter of fact, Mendelssohn's father 
uh, ran a shop in Allenstein. He was a haberdasher, a dry goods dealer. Mendelssohn's mother was a milliner. And what's very interesting about Mendelssohn family in Allenstein at this time is that his father was actually elected to honorary positions within the larger German community in Allenstein. So certainly Germany in the latter half of the 19th century was a very anti-Semitic country. But that doesn't seem to have necessarily come down with its full force on the Mendelssohn family. So they were doing well. The father was respected in the larger German community and Eric was able to go on to get educated in the, the German educational system. And this is uh, some 14 years later when he was 21 years old, about the time he was going to architectural college in, in Munich. Now he was an architect, but he also was an architect with a very artistic streak. He loved to paint among other things. And here we can see the young 21 year old Eric Mendelssohn painting a landscape somewhere in Germany. About the same time, this young woman was living in Mainz in the Western part of Germany. Her name was Louisa Moss and she became Eric Mendelssohn's wife. She was about 16 years old when this photograph was taken. And it's actually about the time that she married Eric Mendelssohn. So he was um, a student. She was still living at home. She loved music. She loved the cello. And around this time, she actually had thought that she might become a professional musician. Once she got married, that opportunity wasn't available anymore because a professional musician who was a married woman was an impossibility in, um, in, in Wilhelmine, Germany. So she couldn't do that. She had to put the cellos up in the cello closet. At least she could play them at home. She couldn't take them out to play them in public anymore. So um, she's 16. She's living in a very, really a very prosperous family. Mendelssohn, Eric Mendelssohn is living um, in a more trade oriented family. He's a student, they get married. And this is about the same time. This is 1916. This is Eric and, and Louisa around the time they got married. Now, 1916, of course, was the, in the, the very middle of the First World War. And Eric Mendelssohn was serving in the Imperial German Army. So he is, his initial service in the German Army was on the Eastern Front facing the Russian Army. The Bolsheviks took over in Russia in 1917. They reached an agreement with Germany. They shut down the Eastern Front and Mendelssohn was moved to the Western Front and he spent the rest of the First World War on the Western Front and he was decommissioned from the German army late in 1918 or early in 1919. And what he did when he was decommissioned was to move to Berlin. He was, he was, um, he was an architect, he opened up a practice and 10 years later, this is the Eric Mendelssohn family. So that's Eric Mendelssohn on the right. That's Louisa in her leopard skin coat in the middle. And that's their daughter, Esther Mendelssohn. Uh, the young woman on the left. And what they're doing here, because it's kind of an odd setting, um, this is the first day of construction at Eric Mendelssohn's villa in Berlin. So the years from 1919, his, de his decommissioning, demobilization from the German army to um, 1929 were very good to Eric Mendelssohn and his family. He became famous as an architect in Berlin where his practice was. And he also became wealthy. As a matter of fact, when this photograph was taken in 1929, Eric Mendelssohn's office, the firm that he had founded and owned in Berlin, was actually the largest architectural firm in Europe. He had about 40 people working for him. He took that fame and that fortune. And now after 10 years of working very hard, he decided to build this villa. And we'll hear more about the villa in a few minutes in, 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 in Berlin. And that's what this picture is about. So. Um, the villa was done in, in about a year, and here is Esther, his daughter, um, pushing around a bit with her dad, Eric Mendelssohn, on the back terrace of the villa. You get an idea from this picture that this villa was quite a luxurious structure. There's a large plate glass window. There's wood paneling. We've got the stonework around the edging, around the edge of the terrace. And in fact, it really was a very luxurious villa for the, for the Mendelssohn family. And this is Eric Mendelssohn sitting on the back terrace. So there he is, it's site is, is magnificent. He's on a lake, he's got a beautiful wooded lot and he's got the, these planters around the edge of the terrace with these lush geraniums there. He's hired the very famous celebrity photographer in the Weimar era, 
Lada Jacoby to photograph his picture on the terrace of his of his spanking brand new villa in um, in Berlin. And I think he looks quite satisfied and he was right then and there. One thing to note about Lada Jacoby is that she was Jewish. And it turns out that when you look at, at many of Mendelssohn's acquaintances, people who worked for Eric Mendelssohn and his clients, they were Jewish. So he was living in a very Jewish community, a very Jewish bubble inside the Weimar era in Germany during the 1920s and into the 1930s. So let's take a quick look at, at this circle a bit. So the woman on the right side with the cigarette and the camera is Lada Jacoby herself, taking a self-portrait in this case. The man at the top is, is Chaim Weizmann. And Weizmann, of course, was British. He wasn't German. He didn't know Mendelssohn in Berlin, but he knew Mendelssohn very well when Mendelssohn moved to Palestine and opened up his office. And in fact, Weizmann became Mendelssohn's client and he hired Eric Mendelssohn to build what's known today as the Weizmann Villa in Rehovot, um, Israel. And uh, Weizmann, of course, was the, the first president of Israel. That was a number of years after this photo was taken. And so that, that Mendelssohn Villa for a number for years, at least while Weizmann was there was something of the Israeli, Israeli White House. On the left side of the page is Martin Buber. Now, I don't know if Buber and the Mendelssohns actually knew each other, but Eric and Louisa Mendelssohn were followers of Buber. They, they listened to his philosophy, they studied it, they talked about it. They thought he had very valuable, valuable ideas about Judaism and Jews and how they relate to God to the larger society. At the bottom of the page, of course, you recognize Albert Einstein. And the reason I've picked a photo of Einstein with a violin is because it was not unusual for Albert Einstein to show up at the front door of Mendelssohn Villa in Berlin, ring the bell with his violin, violin case under his arm, be let inside and, and open up the case. And then Louisa would go to her cello closet, pull out a cello, and then Albert Einstein and Louisa and maybe a couple of other friends would would come by and they'd have an evening of music together. So this, this is the, the level of, of life that uh, the Mendelssohns had in Berlin during the warmer era. Einstein was um, something of a Mendelssohn client um, and um, certainly a social acquaintance and they, they knew each other. And as I mentioned, Einstein and Louisa Mendelssohn made music together at the Mendelssohn Villa. So let's take another longer look at the Mendelssohn Villas. This is a house, that Eric, a house, a book Eric Mendelssohn wrote uh, in the early 1930s about his house. And he call, called it Neues Haus, Neue Welt. New house, new world. And certainly when an architect publishes a book about his house, he's proud about the structure and he's gonna talk about the house. He, he might even call the, the book something like My House or A New House. What's interesting about the title that Mendelssohn shows is that he adds this phrase new world because an architect isn't necessarily thought of as making a new world. I mean, we wouldn't think of the house that he built for himself as his family of being part of a new world, but for Mendelssohn, they very much were. So his buildings, everything he built, particularly the villa that he built in Berlin were not just a place to be comfortable with his family in a luxurious setting. They also had an opinion about themselves and about the world and were an attempt to make a statement and contribute to this construction of the new world. So Mendelssohn's ideas or his architecture was first of all functional, but second of all, actually idealistic towards, towards an end. And we're gonna see more of that when he builds the synagogues. And in fact, that idea was so much a part of his heart um, he couldn't let go of it, even if his clients objected. And he did have fights and arguments with the, some of the synagogue clients about his ideas of harmony and how that should work into a synagogue in the United States. But first, let's look at what he talked about in his, in his own house. So this is the living room. And um, what I've highlighted here, I pulled out a bit of the caption. I've highlighted this phrase, new harmony with the hall, because this idea of a new harmony is part and parcel of Mendelssohn's idea of the new world. And we're going to see this exact phrase when used by Eric Mendelssohn in conversation with his American clients. It was very much part of how he worked, not just the building that was a house or a synagogue, but also a building where everything was in harmony. So for example, in this room, um, Mendelssohn designed the chairs, Mendelssohn designed the table, Mendelssohn designed the lighting. He didn't make the artwork on the wall that came from somebody else. 
He did design or have a say in the wall coverings, the floor coverings, the floor materials, all materials, the colors, all of that, everything in the room had to be in harmony in, in the interior, but also with the exterior and the larger idea of the structure that he was trying to, trying to formulate. So this is the front gate of Mendelssohn's villa in Berlin. Um, you can see it's a very private place. It, it's got an iron gate. There's a wall around it. You can see the villa itself peeking out from above the wall. It was very much, um, very much in the stage. This is what it looked like from a bird's eye view. This is also a photo from Mendelssohn's book. Now, um, when we look at this, we can say it sort of checks off a lot of the boxes for what modernist German Weimar era architecture should look like. First of all, it's white and they always have to be white. Even in Tel Aviv, they call it the, the Bauhaus neighborhood, the white city. It has a flat roof, it's very rectilinear. Those are all elements of this Bauhaus or white city kind of architecture. Um, Mendelssohn actually didn't use those elements that much. It's a little bit uh, unusual, I think, a surprise that his house is so formulaic almost. White walls, strongly rectilinear up and down, crosswise the flat roof. He's got this band of windows that we see on the right side. Also very much a Weimar architecture kind of idea. Um, it breaks up the rectil rectilinearity a little bit in a horizontal way, it's darker and it has a re repeating sequence of windows. Um, those are sort of the formal aspects, but also he's concerned, Eric Mendelssohn is concerned with comfort. And we can read from this photograph of his house, how much he concerned with comfort he is by the fact that the house is surrounded by terraces. So he has an upper level terrace on the right. He's got a lower level terrace at the bottom. He's got a ground level terrace and one flight up, he's got a, a rear terrace. So there are terraces all around. That's a statement about the house needing to be a place of comfort and a place where you can live inside or outside in privacy and enjoy the setting and the environment. This is what this house looked like about five years ago. So I took this photo in 2016. And uh, certainly the, the most obvious thing about the picture is the house looks pretty much the same today as it looked when it was built in 1930. And that's really amazing because if you think about it, that's some 85 years between when the house was built and when this photograph was taken. And during those 85 years, there was a lot of history in Berlin. There was a huge amount of devastation in the city. There was a huge amount of restoration and renovation from 1930 to 2016. Throughout all of that, Mendelssohn's house main, was maintained. Um, and what's more, when we look at it today, it still looks modern. So this was a house that was built to be modern and in harmony in Mendelssohn's way in um, 19, 1930 or so. And that, that modern, out, modern perspective is something that's endured over the years. Another thing that's endured with this house is the fact that it still works the way it was designed to work. It was designed to be a home of luxury for a wealthy family. And that's what it is today. And that's what it was in 2016 when I took this photograph. So it's still, it's still a villa. There's still a family living there and they're still enjoying the luxurious setting and the luxurious in harmony building that Eric Mendelssohn constructed in 1930. And those two features are things we're gonna see in the synagogues. And they're also true of many others, many other of Mendelssohn's buildings. The idea that the, the building functions over decade, decade after decade for the use it was designed to be, whether it's a house or an office building or a hospital or, uh, or a synagogue, it works over decades in that way. And also manages to look um, modern and, and vibrant through all those decades. So this is the front gate of Mendelssohn's Villa, the way it looked in 2016. You can see the city of Berlin put up a, a plaque acknowledging that Eric Mendelssohn lived here for a few years. So, as I mentioned, uh, Mendelssohn left Berlin with his family in 1933. Hitler came to power, and um, one of the first things that the Nazis did in 1933 was to declare that Jews could no longer be members of professional societies. So the Nazis came to power in the winter of 1933, and sure enough, um, early spring, um, Mendelssohn received a letter 
from the president of the Prussian Architecture Society expelling him from that organization because he was a Jew. And that meant that he couldn't practice his profession independently as, a, as an architect with his own firm anymore in Germany. That wasn't acceptable to him. Um, he and his family left that villa we just talked about and saw, and they went first to Amsterdam by train. And from Amsterdam, they went to England where um, Louise Mendelssohn had some family. And Eric Mendelssohn reestablished himself in England. And this is one of his most notable buildings there. So he went into partnership with another architect in the UK named Serge Shremayev. And Mendelssohn and Shremayev got the commission to build this, uh, what's called the Delaware Pavilion, a beach pavilion in a town called Bexhill on Sea in the mid 1930s and they built it. Um, what we see when we look at this photograph is that Unlike Mendelssohn's Villa, there are curves used in the Delaware Pavilion. So you can see there's that very large curved structure that's more typical of Mendelssohn's architecture than the very straight rectilinearity we saw in his villa. And we're going to see curves in the synagogues. There's also a lot of use of glass, which is very typical of, of Mendelssohn's synagogues too. A lot of glass, a lot of curves and softness. Mendelssohn felt that a curved surface, a curved building um, was a lyrical statement. And he felt that the, the rigid Bauhaus kind of uh, structure often needed to be softened a bit to be a little more lyrical. And he wasn't afraid to do that. He always was an architect who listened to himself and to his heart and made his buildings look the way he thought they should look no matter what the conventions were. Um, as with Mendelssohn's Villa, this building is still there today. It's still in use and it still looks the same. So um, it was renovated, I think, in the, in the 1980s, but it's still there on the beach in Bexhill. It's a place where people go to put on their bathing suits, take off their bathing suits, maybe get a bite to eat. Um, and so it, like the villa and other Mendelssohn buildings, has endured both in, in style and also in function over some, some 90 years almost. This is the, the Weizmann house that Mendelssohn designed in Rehovot, Israel. So this is a picture I took uh, about 2016. The house itself was built in 1936. And when you look at this, you see, first of all, that curved structure at the far end of this courtyard with a pool. And then on the right side, you see there's a row of windows. And on the left side, you see there's a row of windows. And on the right side, there's a row of columns. And on the left side, there's a row of columns. And in fact, if you look straight down the middle of this courtyard in the photograph, you can see that the right side and the left side are mirror images. So this courtyard is perfectly symmetrical. Um, the reason that's worth noting is because that's, um, that's, that's not the way a modern building is supposed to be built. So in Weimar, Germany, an architect who built a structure that had a lot of symmetry would not be looked upon favorably. Repetition was okay, like the repetition in the windows in Mendelssohn's villa, but this kind of perfect symmetry was not considered appropriate and not considered modern, not something an architect should do. Mendelssohn didn't really care what his colleagues thought. He felt that for this structure in Rehovah for Chaim Weizmann, his symmetric courtyard with the pool was just right and he built it and it's endured and it's there until this very day. So um, what I'd like to do now is take a brief stop for questions and answers. And once we've answered any questions you might have, we can go on to Mendelssohn's work in America. So if anybody has a question or comment now, I'd be very happy to do my best to answer it. I have one I can ask. Sure. Um, well, how you said about how um, Jews were expelled from professional associations, or organizations like that, um, and German Jews, you know, um, might have been tempted to convert to um, Christianity be, or some other religion because of, you know, not being able to do things like this. Was he ever tempted to do anything like that himself? Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question because there, there were certainly a number of, of Jews who certainly when they were like Mendelssohn, they, were, they had important positions or they had uh, a lot of professional success. They felt it was easier to go another step if they converted to Christianity, but that wasn't the way Mendelssohn went. So he and his wife as well always 
identified very strongly as Jew. His, his family in Allenstein had done that. His father, even though he was um, active in the broader community, identified as a Jew in that community and never converted. And the Mendelssohn family in Berlin as well always were always strongly identified as Jews. So he never went that route. He wasn't observant. He didn't really care to go to shul. He didn't keep Shabbat. But he always was, was proud of the fact that he was Jewish. In fact, he made Aliyah for a number of years as a statement of that identity. So I have a, a question as well. Okay. Um, you know, you focused on the, the villa yeah. uh, and the Weizmann house mm -hmm. um, and the um, whatever, the, the one in um, England. Yeah. It, so he did residential and he did some um, other um, constructions, but did he do, did he get into sacred architecture uh, when, before he came to the U.S. or, or what, what did he really focus on? Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's interesting to look at that. His very first building was actually a Beit Hara, a ritual building for the Jewish cemetery in his hometown in Allenstein. And uh, that was 1912. And then some 17 years later, he built a Beit Hara again in his wife's hometown of Mainz, Germany. But between 1912 and 1929, and after 1929, until he came to the US, he didn't build a single sacred structure that I know about. There was one Jewish community center that he built in Essen, Germany. Um, it wasn't necessarily sacred, it was just a community structure. It was destroyed in 1938 in Kristallnacht. Um, so sacred buildings were, were not something that he really did much of until he came to the US. He had made his money and, and gained fame in Germany building department stores. So he worked with the Schocken family building department stores all over Germany and other parts of Europe. And um, when he went to Israel, he built actually two very famous hospitals. Those were very big projects he had. Rambam Hospital in Haifa he designed for the British Mandatory Authority. And he designed Hadassah Hospital on Mount Scopus in Jerusalem. So those were important commissions. So the, the ritual buildings were something that he really got into once he, uh, once he was in the United States and not very much before that. And I've forgotten, how, how long did he spend in England with, with the partner? He, he was in England uh, full time from 1933 to 1935. And from 1935 to 1939, he was in England part time and part time in Jerusalem. So it was, it was about some seven years, one way or another, he was in England. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Was his uh, villa during the war uh, unscathed? Was it uh, inhabited by someone else? Yeah, I, I don't really know. You know it's, it's a very interesting question. I didn't find the answer out. I know when I was there in 2016 that I was in great shape. I, I think I heard the story that, um, well, between when he left in 1933 and 1945, I really have no idea what happened to it. I, I imagine that it was taken over and I think he actually sold it because he wasn't dead when he left, he probably sold it and got some money for it. He did, he was able to move his furniture out though. So um, I was actually in California a few years ago and visited his granddaughter in her home near San Francisco and we were having lunch and she, she said, oh, by the way, the table that you're eating lunch at in the Cherry City and we're in my grandfather's house in Berlin. So the furniture came, but um, I think he may have sold it. I'm not sure if it was a good price or not. I don't know what it was like in 1945. I, I believe that it was actually in the British zone of occupation after that. And it was used by the, the British, some British um, government official. And once uni reunification happened, it, it was occupied again by a rich family. And that's, I just really know those sketch, sketchy details, not much more. Anybody else have a question or a comment? I guess one more. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that he was artistic and he designed all of the what, interior pieces for his own villa. Did he do a lot with furniture or just, just for personal? Um, he did a lot for furniture, yeah. 
um, is an interesting story about Eric Mendelssohn and the, the Park Synagogue in Cleveland. So the rabbi there, Rabbi Armin Cohen, became a great friend of Mendelssohn. And once when Mendelssohn went to Cleveland to visit the site, he told Rabbi Cohen that he didn't like his living room furniture. He didn't like the way it was arranged. He didn't like the furniture. And he designed him a whole new set of furniture and they made it. And my understanding is that um, Rabbi, when I was there five years ago, Rabbi Cohen's daughter, who was quite old, was still using Mendelssohn's furniture. So he had an interest, a continuing interest in designing everything. Furniture, lights, textiles, the whole, the whole business. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. So let's, let's go on then. We'll have another chance for questions in about 25 minutes. So he came to America in 1941. And he got here with his family around May 1941 from, um, from Jerusalem. And he hit the ground running. And this is an inventory of an exhibition that Eric Mendelssohn was able to have at the Museum of Modern Art in Manhattan, the MoMA, in November 1941 until January 1942. So um, the inventory is several pages long. I just showed the first page because I really wanted to make the point that his reputation was strong before he got here. He basically got off the boat and the next thing he was able to do was get an exhibition mounted at the moment in New York. It's not an easy achievement. And he was able to show essentially every, every building he had designed, every significant building he designed during his career from the Einstein Tower, which is his breakout building, his first significant commission uh, near Berlin in Germany, down through a number of buildings in Germany. We have his buildings in Palestine on this list. And as you go through other pages, you'll see more of his buildings. Um, so um, he was well thought of and he wanted to reestablish his practice. And fortunately, because of the war, he wasn't able to get an architect's license. Actually, he wasn't able to get an architect's license until he became a citizen. That required waiting five years. And so in 1946, he got his license. And right around that time, of course, the war was over and uh, the American Jewish community was in a new world. The Holocaust had happened in Europe. Um, in Palestine, the state of Israel was, was being born. Um, there, was, there was conflict, there was agitation to establish state of Israel. And um, there were tens of thousands of Jewish GIs coming back to America from all over the world. It was a new world. And people were talking about what this meant for Jewish life in the US. Rachel Wissenser Bernstein was uh, a historian, an art historian who herself was a German Jew. She came from Berlin to New York to the US in the mid thirties. She reestablished herself and she developed a particular interest in architectural history and in in synagogue architecture. And in 1947, she published an article in the journal Commentary about what she thought should happen with Jewish architecture, architecture in the post-war period. And what she said is that it's really a new world for American Jews. We, the American Jewish community needs to be more self-conscious of who we are. We need to be more assertive, more, more obviously identifying as Jews in the United States maybe even more noticeable in the larger community. She says that historically, Jewish communities did not want to stress differences with the larger community or look conspicuous, but the time for that, that era is over now with this new, new reality post-war and American Jewish communities should be conspicuous, particularly in their community buildings. What better way to proclaim the new freedom and equality of the Jew at home in America than in, in synagogues and she specifically called out Eric Mendelssohn as an architect whom she thought could make buildings that had this conspicuousness. And she said that Mendelssohn should be, should be working on this, this idea of the flamboyant even Jewish synagogue and Mendelssohn embraced that idea. He wrote an article a few months later, uh, I think in June, 1947 and said, yeah, it's a great idea and I'm ready to do it. And he did. So, um, this I think is one of his more conspicuous flamboyant buildings. This is Mount Zion Temple in St. Paul, Minnesota. And, and if you look at it, certainly it is flamboyant and conspicuous. This is from, from near the street. You're not gonna miss this building if you're walking in front of it. It's, it, it's something that stands out, it's 
clearly separate and distinct from everything else that's happening in the neighborhood. And it's overtly Jewish. It says what it is in a very loud, clear voice. If you look on the front of that, what they call a steeple on the right side of the page, you see there's a menorah there, a, a clear Jewish symbol. And that's what happened to all these buildings, how all these buildings were created actually to make this kind of very strong conspicuous statement. And as we saw, it was done very deliberately. This is across the street. So this building is sited on a beautiful, beautiful boulevard in a nice neighborhood. There's trees and lots of grass. The building you can see has these large steeples that are very noticeable. The building itself, of course, is quite noticeable. And what's more, what you can see is what's behind me as I took this photograph. When I went and spoke to the people at Mount, Mount Zion Temple, they said, well, you probably noticed the mansions that are across the street from the synagogue. And I said, yeah, of course. And they said, well, those mansions were built in the early part of the 20th century by the men who had made fortunes in mining and lumber in Minnesota. And when Mount Zion congregation wanted to build a new synagogue in the mid 1940s, they picked this neighborhood and they picked this location directly across the street from those mansions on purpose because they wanted to make this very strong statement that they're here. They're here, they're Americans, they're in St. Paul and they're gonna build anywhere they want, even across the street in the movers and shakers of the larger community. So they made that statement in 1950 when this, when this structure was built and they're still making that statement today. And the congregation still is very aware and conscious that that's what they're doing with these buildings because of where they're sited. And Mendelssohn was chosen to make that very big, strong statement. This is B'nai Amuna in St. Louis. This is the first synagogue that Eric Mendelssohn built in the United States. It's, this is a street view. Again, it's, uh, it's an important street in the vicinity, near, not in St. Louis itself, but near St. Louis. Uh, and um, it's another conspicuous building. It was built before Mount Zion Temple. It has maybe more of a European look. So if you look on the left of the photograph, we have the flat roof. There's a narrow band of windows under the roof. It's sort of uh, maybe even mid, mid 1920s Weimar kind of a look. There are porthole windows. On the right side, there's a great big parabolic roof that you see sweeping down to the ground. That's over the main sanctuary. And you can see a, a medallion on the side of that. Inside that medallion is a Star of David. So again, this is a building that's very conspicuous. It's overtly Jewish. It has a clear Jewish symbol on it. And that's all done on purpose to make this, this statement about who we are and what we're doing here. If you go around the corner, this is the the school wing for this building. And Mendelssohn had the idea, and he stated it in this commentary article, that every synagogue now should have three, three elements. There needs to be a sanctuary, of course, for worship. There needs to be a social hall for community events. And there needs to be a school to educate children. And this is the school that he built for B'nai Muna in St. Louis. And what's notable about this, this school wing, I think, to me, is the use of glass. So we saw at, at uh, the Delaware Pavilion in, in, in Bexel on Sea that he loved glass walls and he used them a lot. But I think the glass wall here has a different significance than the glass wall perhaps on, on the Delaware Pavilion. And I'm saying that because um, glass is a very interesting building material. It, it's sort of paradoxical. On the one hand, it's very strong. It creates a barrier between the outside and the inside like every other wall does. But on the other hand, Unlike bricks or wood or some other kind of building material, um, the durability of that barrier depends on the social contract and mutual respect. Because anybody who wants to can walk up to that glass wall with a stone or a club and throw the stone through or strike it with the club and the barrier falls. The inside and the outside aren't separate and distinct anymore. So the reason glass works as a barrier, as a wall, is only because it's mutual respect. When that respect is gone, glass doesn't work anymore. And certainly what Mendelssohn had in mind and what everybody in this congregation had in mind in 1946 is what had happened in Germany only eight years before, that is Kristallnacht. So in 1938, November 1938, the Nazis in Germany had gone through the entire country, through all of Germany and broken the glass in every single synagogue they could identify. 
and find. And they broke the glass on every Jewish store they could find in the entire country of Germany. And they broke glass in all the Jewish houses that they could find in Germany. That, that Kristallnacht, that statement of anti-Semitism is often thought of as the beginning of the Holocaust because it was a clear statement of this lack of respect, the end of the social contract between German Jews, Jews and the larger society. So when only eight years later, the St. Louis Jewish community builds a glass wall, they're saying very clearly that this is a different place. This isn't Germany. Everybody knows what happened in Germany on Kristallnacht, but that's not going to happen in St. Louis. And Mendelssohn was all on board with that. So perhaps in the Delaware Pavilion, glass was more of an architectural feature here in St. Louis and in his other buildings, it was maybe a, a stronger statement than just a statement about modernism. This is the Park Synagogue in Cleveland. And when this synagogue was built, that, that large dome we see there was actually the fourth largest dome in the world. So you can see, again, there's a heavy use of glass at the base of the dome. And at the top, there's a finial. And what that is actually <coughs> is, is the tablets of the Ten Commandments. Um, so again, we have a very conspicuous structure, <coughs> very conspicuous structure, and a structure with a clear Jewish symbol on it. This is the front door for the Cleveland Synagogue. And on either side of that door, you can see there are, there is what looks like an anchor. And that's actually the Hebrew letter Shin. So there's a Shin on the right, a Shin on the left. And in fact, the grill work that you see all around the door is made up of little Shins. And when you walk inside this building, it seemed like every corner there was another Shin. So Mendelssohn really used that Shin motif, that idea of the Shin very much in this synagogue um, in particular, but also we'll see it in his other synagogues as well. This is Temple Emmanuel in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This was the last synagogue that Eric Mendelssohn built. Um, the notable feature here, I think, is the way the roof line works. So we've got the center square column, rectangular column, and we've got the roof going out, has sort of a, a sense of ascent. It's a bit like the birds of a wing ascending up. And perhaps the idea here was to remind us that just as the, the roof has the shape of a bird ascending, our prayers as well, the prayers that are spoken underneath this roof should have the wings to carry them up to, to, to heaven too. And this is Temple Emmanuel, the street view. So it looks a lot like what we saw with other synagogues. There's, there's a large lawn, there's a lot of trees. Um, it might remind you of Mendelssohn's backyard on his villa. There's a lot of trees, there's lawns. It's actually a residential community. So this is a very, a very conspicuous sort of flamboyant structure in that, in that residential setting. And um, this is a newspaper clipping that I was shown when I went to Grand Rapids a few years ago was published in the Grand Rapids Press in June, 1915. It's a report to the larger community in Grand Rapids about what the Jewish community is doing. So um, the Grand Rapids Jewish community really wanted everybody else in Grand Rapids to be aware that they had hired this famous synagogue, Eric Mendelssohn, to come to Grand Rapids and design their synagogue. So there's an interview with Eric Mendelssohn that's reported on here. There's some discussion of, of what's going on with the, the building. Um, the photograph is a photograph of a model because it, in 1950, the building hadn't been built yet, so they took a picture of the model. But again, it's an attempt to make this large statement, to make a large statement to the broader community about what the Jews in that town are doing. And this is documentation of that from Grand Rapids. And for Grand Rapids, these are the men who did it. So this is the, the temple board for Temple Emmanuel in 1950. That's Eric Mendelssohn sitting in the middle with a bow tie. And over on the right is Michael Gallus, his assistant in the San Francisco office. And around the table are the men who worked with Mendelssohn, who raised the money to get it built, and who worked to, to finalize the design. So that's the exterior. And certainly an architect designs the exterior of his building. But as we've talked about, Mendelssohn wanted to design everything. He wanted to design the furniture in his villa. He wanted to design the furniture in the synagogues. He wanted to design the menorahs, the arcs, the eternal light, all of it. And he was able to do that to some extent. That coincides with what Rachel Vissenser talked about in her article. She says that we have to respect tradition on the, with the ritual items inside a synagogue. But we don't want to imitate what was done before. This is a new era. This is the modern times. 
we can interpret what was done with the menorah and make it modern. That's exactly what Eric Mendelssohn was about. Taking these familiar, familiar items and interpreting them according to his philosophy of a new world for this new world and making them new. Now that, that wasn't without its difficulty. So this is a letter that Eric Mendelssohn wrote to Rabbi Gunther Plout, uh, who was the rabbi at the time at Mount Zion Temple in St. Paul. And what I've highlighted and read is this phrase, sentimental remembrance. So apparently what happened is that the congregation wanted to bring some of their old stuff from their old building to Mendelssohn's new building. And he has this derogatory phrase, sentimental remembrance to describe what they wanna do. And he points out what's in green that he's building a new world in harmony. There's no place for sentiment in Eric Mendelssohn's world. So please, you're not gonna be allowed to bring your stuff to my building. And as a matter of fact, he got his way here. Now, what I've highlighted in green are these phrases in New World in Harmony. And the reason I've highlighted them is because these are exactly the words we saw in his book about his villa, Neues Haus, Neue Welt. This idea of the creation of a new world, where everything had to be in Eric Mendelssohn's idea of harmony was something that was part and parcel of Mendelssohn's soul. It was something that he did in his own house in Berlin, but that idea didn't leave him when he left Berlin went to Jerusalem or went from Jerusalem to the United States. And he was gonna to stick to that, even though it put him in conflict with his clients and Minneapolis wasn't the only place he had trouble with this idea. So let's look at some of the things that he designed. First of all, here's the menorah that he designed for B'nai Muna, his first synagogue. And I think it's quite clear this is not traditional in any way. It's clearly a menorah. There are seven arms like a menorah has got but it doesn't look like anything, let's say like the menorah on Hadrian's Arch in Rome or any other menorah we might see. But he does have something of a reminder of that menorah motif. So if you look at the bottom of each of these arms, there's this little brass triangle and sort of a column coming off. That reminds me of a wisp of smoke. So this is sort of an idea of an olive oil lamp with a wisp of smoke coming off of that. And he's repeated that motif for each of the arms. So he's interpreting the traditional idea of menorah for, for the modern times. This is what he did in, in Cleveland. So here he's got um, the light on top, but he's got these, these conserving, these curving arms, um, one inside the other and the central, the seventh arm in the center. So again, this is clearly recognizable as a menorah, but it's kind of an abstraction of the menorah idea. It's an interpretation that, as Rachel Wissens was suggested doing in her article. And here in, in St. Paul, Minnesota, he's gone a somewhat different way. We've got seven arms. That seems to be a rigid part of having a menorah. We can't give up on that. He's got the light on top here, but again, he's got the menorah very vertical. And, and this is a very vertical room. In fact, he's put these vertical slats on the wall and the arms of the menorah work with that, those vertical slats to really emphasize the verticality of this room and this structure. He softened it a bit as he loved to do with some curves. So there's a bit of lyricism in the base, but the verticality is, is the main note in this menorah. And it's in harmony with the verticality in the rest of the structure. In Grand Rapids, he's got a menorah that's reminiscent of what he did in Cleveland, not exactly. The Cleveland menorah had a round cross section for the arms and this has got a square cross section. But again, we have we have these, um, these nested arms to give us six, six branches of, of the menorah and then the, the center arm um, in the, dividing this, those, the right side and the left side. So as with so much of Eric Mendelssohn, he didn't reuse the same idea exactly um, at all. So what he did in, in St. Louis is different from what he did in Cleveland, which is different than what he did in in Minnesota and St. Paul. Here in Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids, he's somewhat going back to what he had done earlier, but not quite, not quite. He's changed the design a bit, he's changed the base, he's changed the profile. Now the Torah arcs that Mendelssohn designed, this is the one at Menea Muna in St. Louis. So there are really two pieces here. There's the top piece that we see. It has the shape of, of the tablets where the law was, and you can see He's enumerated the Ten Commandments, five on the right and five on the left. And he's got these quadrilateral structures that kind of look like electron tubes, I guess, one next to the other. And I think what he's thinking of here, the motif he's working on 
is the wings of the Karuvim. So the, um, the, the arrow in the case in the, in the sanctuary in the desert, desert and in the first temple had these angelic figures on either end and there aren't, there, there were, they had wings that spread out and sort of, uh, sort of protected the, the case itself. And I think Mendelssohn is referencing those wings around the case of the law and what we see here. And then he's got the bottom, which is a, a different kind of structure. The bottom and top clearly work together, but they're not identical. And then when we look at the bottom, he's, he's brought in this, this curved motif, these wavy lines. And that reminds me of, of water. It looks like water flowing. And there's certainly an idea, a notion in Jewish thought that the Torah is like water. It flows from on high down to us down here. So the idea that water flows from on high, on high down to us here on the earth to refresh us is a metaphor for Torah. And I think he might be referring to that here to say, we're going to open up these Torah doors and take out the Sefer Torah or Sifre Torah. And that's gonna be refreshment for us just like water refreshes. In, in Cleveland, a different idea. So here are the doors of the, of the Ark are made out of wood. And here we can see his obsession with the shin that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So normally when we have this kind of tablet motif on something in front of a Torah that it's gonna be a, we're gonna have the 10 commandments in them, whether there be Aleph, Bet, Gimel down to the 10th Hebrew letter Yud, but he's thrown those away. He's given us 10 shins instead. I don't really know why. People have suggested, well, shin is the first letter of Shaddai, a name of God that we find on the back of the mezuzah or it's the first letter of Shema Yisrael, or it's the first letter of Shalom. Maybe it's those, maybe it's all three, maybe it's something else. Whatever it is, it, it worked very strongly on Mendelssohn's soul and he, he wanted to use the Shin motif here. And this is Mount Zion Temple in St. Paul, Minnesota. So this is that very vertical room and he, he's taken that verticality in the, the art door but again, he's softened it up. He's gone to his shin idea. He's used the curved shin motif to give us some lyricism in this very strongly vertical room and, and maybe make it a, a bit softer. So he's differentiating the, the Torah door, maybe the, the, the chesed of Torah, the soft curves from the, the more rigid uh, um, aspects of Torah that the building itself seems to talk about. And this is what he did at Temple Emmanuel in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So Mendelssohn died while this building was being designed and he wasn't alive when this part of the room was constructed. He did design the center part, the Torah arc doors with the Shema Yisrael and the column above that with uh, shin and, and sort of a, a nested, couple of nested shins above that. The rest of the wall, the mural that's there was done by a muralist named Lucianne Block who Mendelssohn um, designated for the work, but the, de the design itself was Lucy M. Block's design and execution was hers also. And now the eternal light. This is the light that Mendelssohn designed for under the great dome in the park synagogue. And um, when I look at this, my eye concentrates and focuses on that great black nozzle. And what I see there is a rocket ship nozzle. And I thought that was kind of crazy until I saw an interview with Louisa Mendelssohn that was done around 1968. And, and she had mentioned in, in passing in the interview that her husband had actually been very interested in, in rockets and space travel. So it could very well be when he designed the eternal light for Cleveland, he had the idea of space travel and rocketry in mind when he designed this, this fixture. That wasn't of course what he had in mind when he designed the small chandelier also in the park synagogue in the small sanctuary there. So they call this the sunflower chandelier. So like the one on the main floor, it's metal. It has blades coming out, these metal blades coming out. It's smaller scale. It doesn't have a nozzle in the center. And it looks a bit like a flower with the petals around the central, stru central structure. And that's how people have referred to it. So again, the idea is that Mendelssohn was, uh, was infinitely creative. He had new and creative insights all the time for everything he was designing. This is what he designed for Mount Zion Temple in St. Paul. So we have a very large metal structure, but unlike the ones he had at the Park Synagogue, this is very open. He's gone to the shin again. He's using four shins. They have a very open layout. And when I look at this sort of um, in opposition to a, the rocket ship nozzle, 
at the Park Synagogue, it reminds me of a wagon wheel. And the idea of mobility was certainly an important feature of modernism and the modernist ethic. And it could be that the mobility and what the wagon wheel represents to St. Paul, it was, um, there was a bit of a pioneer spirit, pioneer spirit there, maybe something Eric Mendelssohn was referencing when he, when he designed this. And he died in 1953 and um, the congregation at Temple Emmanuel sent a condolence note to his wife, Louisa in San Francisco. And in June, 1954, she wrote them the answer. And what I want to just to look at here and linger on for a second is the first line in the third paragraph of Louisa Mendelssohn's note. And she wrote, I know that with Eric's building, a great and noble bird, his spirit will dwell with all of you. So the idea that the, that roof line that we saw in um, Temple Emmanuel, where there's a central rectangular column and sort of ascending wing, bird, the ascending wings of a bird that was an authentic I, notion that Mendelssohn was trying to put into the building that he discussed with his wife. So seeing motifs and seeing metaphors in his construction is a very valid way, I think, to look at it. And those, those metaphors and motifs can certainly inspire us today. So this is a summary of, of Mendelssohn's life. He was born in 1887 in Einstein, Germany, and that's now in Poland. He practiced architecture in Germany from 1912 to 1933 when the Nazis came to power and he, he couldn't be an architect anymore and he left. He moved from uh, Germany to the UK. In the mid thirties, he established an office in Jerusalem. For a few years, he was commuting between Jerusalem and his UK office and in 39, he made Aliyah and he moved to Jerusalem and his office there was his full-time practice until 1941. When, he, when the war effort um, requisitioned all the materials, all the building materials and capital in Mandate Palestine. And Eric Mendelssohn and his wife decided to emigrate to the US. He was able to get visas. They took that long roundabout route we saw about an hour ago to the US and he reestablished himself here in America. He began practicing architecture again in 1946 and from 46 to 53, he had an active practice in architecture. And during those, those years, this, um, these synagogues that we've just talked about were constructed. And I think it's fair to say they are the major achievement of his, of his, of his practice while he was in the United States. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, again, this is the cover of, of the book. And if you go to Amazon and uh, search on Eric Mendelssohn and me, Michael Craig Palmer, you'll get taken to the book and you can, you can have a look at it. So if, Anybody has got a, a question or a comment now, I'd be very happy to do my best to answer it for you. Did he do other, other buildings while he was in the US? Because he really didn't practice for all that many years or was he really just focused on those synagogues? Um, I think the synagogues were his main effort. He did a, he did a hospital in San Francisco um, and here is too. He did, he did a few houses. He has a house in San Francisco. Um, he may have done a house in Cleveland. He has an office building. Actually, the first, the first office building in Silicon Valley, Varian Associates, was one that Eric Mendelson designed. That building is still there. I was there a few years ago. And that really is, is it. He, during those years when he couldn't practice architecture, he did a lot of teaching, he worked on a book that never got published. So the synagogues are his major achievement for those years. And he's got in the background, these other buildings that he was able to work on too. Okay, thank you. I noticed um, that Percival Goodman, a famous architect, I think he had a role in our building. And I know he did the famous Shari Tzedek in Southfield. I guess he was kind of getting started with synagogues. Um, right around in the last years of Mendelssohn's life, did the two of them know each other, have any kind of relationship? Was Goodman in, influenced by Mendelssohn in any way? Uh, they were actually competitors and looking at Eric Mendelssohn's letters, all, by the way, all, the, all of the letters between Mendelssohn and his wife have been put online and they're all available to be read. But looking at those letters, he does mention from time to time that he's going to compete for a building the synagogue and Percival Goodman is also competing. And that's like, uh-oh, that's a problem for us. So um, he, they knew of each other, they competed with each other. 
I, I don't know much about Percival Goodman, except that he was much, much more prolific than Eric Mendelssohn and lived a lot longer. I think Mendelssohn, these four synagogues, and Mendelssohn was done when he passed away in 53, and Percival Goodman did something like 80, I think into the 1980s. So um, during those years when they were competing, they knew of each other. Whether um, Goodman was influenced by Mendelssohn, I can't say, I don't really know if he was or not. I have a few questions. Um, one, you, um, well, first I wanted to know, kind of piggybacking on Dan's question, did he know Frank Lloyd Wright? And because I see, I see a lot of like Frank Lloyd, like not Frank Lloyd Wright, just the unique, the unique nature of the synagogues, like reminds me of some of the homes I've been to that Frank Lloyd Wright has done. So I was just curious about that. And then I'll let you answer and then I'll ask you what else I have. Okay, fine. Yeah, it's interesting. They, um, Frank Lloyd Wright and Eric Mendelson had shared an employee, they had a common employee. So there's a man named Richard Neutra who was from Vienna, but he worked in the early twenties in Mendelssohn's office in Berlin. He left Mendelssohn's office in the early twenties. He came to the US and he worked for Frank Lloyd Wright. And then Mendelssohn came to the US in the mid twenties and Neutra put together a meeting between Frank Lloyd Wright and Mendelssohn. And there's a, a well-known photograph of the three of them, Mendelssohn, Frank Lloyd Wright and Richard Neutra sitting together in Wisconsin having a joke or something, laughing, laughing out loud. So they, they knew each other, they were aware, um, whether they, whether, I don't know if they had a continuing contact, I kind of doubt it because I don't think Frank Lloyd Wright has mentioned much or at all in, in Eric Mendelssohn's letters after, the, after they met. Um, it may have been just sort of a, a standoffish kind of relationship of mutual respect, but not really more than that, but they, they did know each other. Okay, I also want to, I know you mentioned how it, from 1946 to 53 is when he was practicing here in the United States. Yeah. So it's just over those seven years, those four, those four synagogues, like, I mean, it's, was there any overlap in terms of that building them at the same time? Or was he in one place and then they moved to the next one? Or, I mean, that's only a very, it seems like a very short amount of time for the work that needed to be done. Yeah, there was a lot of overlap. So um he started, I, he had contact with some of the congregations earlier than 1946 and there were discussions. Um, once he was licensed and able to practice, yes. Certainly the, the synagogue in St. Louis and the one in Cleveland were actually being constructed at the same time. And um, Mount Zion Temple was also, also being constructed while there was work being done in Park Synagogue in Cleveland. And uh, the synagogue in Grand Rapids as well was being worked on while the synagogue in, in uh, St. Paul was worked on. Now, the last two, the St. Paul synagogue and the Grand Rapids synagogues were not completed when Mendelssohn died. So the, the continuing work went on after his death. So it's actually a number of years more till all of them are done, but he was doing a lot of traveling. It's kind of, he spent a lot of time on planes. He would fly from San Francisco, then travel around the Midwest and then fly back to San Francisco. We had a lot of things going on at once for a few years. And finally, um, I'm presuming that these synagogues, since you've taken these pictures more recently, are all still active and, and working synagogues. Is that true? They're all working synagogues. They're not necessarily working in those buildings. So uh, the ones that are still using Mendelssohn's building are Saint, um, the synagogue in St. Paul, Mount Zion Temple, and uh, the, the synagogue in St. Louis and, and Grand Rapids. So those two, Temple Emmanuel, they're still using the building and using the way using it the way Mendelssohn designed it. So again, that's an example of his designs enduring decade after decade. In Cleveland, the congregation still owns it and they've been using it part-time so for maybe the past 30 years. Um, so they've been using it maybe once every couple of weeks for the past 30 years. They built another building, I think in the 1980s or 1990s, that's their main building now. And yeah. just the past few years, they've decided, past few months, I mean, they decided they wanna sell the Mendelssohn building. So today it's still being used as a synagogue by the congregation that hired Mendelssohn, but that may not be the case for much longer. In St. Louis, B'nai Amuna, that congregation made it, built a new building probably in the 80s too, and they left. And the building is today owned by a creative arts center called COCA. 
They're very respectful of the legacy as a Jewish community structure and Mendelssohn. So you can see from the photographs, it's, it still really looks very much the way it looked. They, they did make changes, but uh, if you look from the front or the side, you really don't notice what they did. It's still, still very much Mendelssohn's building and in the interior as well. This, this might be more of a, <clears throat> of a comment, but in one of your slides, I noticed that the mural, I think it was the mural was completed by Lucien Bloch who was an apprentice um, of uh, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo? I'm not sure an apprentice is the right word. She was an associate and she learned from them. Yes. Okay. I just thought it was interesting because um, Rivera has done the, you know, this amazing mural at the Detroit Institute of Art. And Yeah, there, there is a strong Michigan connection to Rivera and that building is in Grand Rapids. Um, right, okay. Yeah. Right, thank you. This has been really interesting, really interesting. Thank you, yeah. It's a great story. I mean, one of the reasons I really wanted to do Eric Nielsen is because his personal story and his life really follows the arc of Jewish life during those years in the first half of the 20th century. So it's, it's a way for us to learn through a personal story about Jewish experience and Jewish history, um, you know, from the late 19th century into mid-century and even today. Right. You know, I'm not sure how well known he is in the what, in the architectural world, I guess, um, among like students, but he just was so creative. Yeah, he was very creative. I mean, what I've heard is that every architecture student who takes a course in the history of architecture learns about at least one Mendelssohn building. That's the building in Berlin called the Einstein Tower. But the whole the whole oeuvre, his, all of his work as a unit is, is really not well known. Yeah, that's really <laughs> Is there any evidence he was related to Moses Mendelssohn or Felix Mendelssohn, part of that Mendelssohn family? Yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't encountered or run into any evidence of that. He's, Eric used one S and I think Felix used two S's. I'm not sure right. about Moses Mendelssohn. But I, I don't really know if there's a family connection there. Okay, are there any? I'm, so, can you, I'm sorry. My, Jared wants a different show. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Are there any? Are there any other? David, will you help him? Are there any other questions um, that anybody has or any comments? I, I hope everyone enjoyed it. I thought it was very, very educational and enjoyable. Um, and we will be posting the the um, the link to, I'll put it on YouTube um, for the video um, so that we can put post it to the website and to the um, Shul Facebook page. And um, if you'd like a copy yourself, I'm happy to just send it to you, but you'll be able to find it, find it there. Um, so I really wanna say thank you so very much to Michael Palmer for this wonderful presentation and for allowing us to share it beyond today. So, and again, a reminder that at the end of the month, we're having another, another tour that I'd love for all of you to attend as well. Thank you very much. It was great. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you. you. It was wonderful. It was great. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Beth. Hey, sure. Have a great day. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. If anybody Bye. wants Bye. to purchase his book, it's available on Amazon. So please do, okay. do look. Okay. So long, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you. Bye. Have a great day.